her research interests might be in critical discourse studies, various perspectives of minority groups, issues, and policies, as well as media and communication studies. Thank you for that. I'm going to have you come here. I'm going to be representing you mightily. There's a press for me. Um, so, as we have been looking at the title slide for quite a bit now. So um, this is what I plan to do today, and I promise I'm going to finish by 25 uh, schedule. So I'll give you some rationale for which, uh, behind choosing uh, behind this topic and, and why why I've decided to uh, to embark on this research. I'll provide you with some background on the uh, in a hate speech campaign, and I'll also give you the theoretical framework I've employed in my research. Um, I'll discuss some of the methodological um, um, challenges that I've had and provide some pre preliminary findings and um, discuss things. So, why this topic? I, I uh, started dealing with uh, online hate speech as a practitioner, so it kind of enabled me to combine the two things I've been doing with that that's research on, on various uh, types of communication in media, but also uh, combined elements, combined with elements of youth work and uh, education, and some educational dimension as well. Um, also, I think hate speech uh, is really, really one of the burning issues that we have nowadays with the media. On its view, and why positive discourse analysis? Um, some may or may not agree, but I think that um, Martin's right when he says that focusing only on, on, on what's wrong with the society kind of cripples our, our vision. And uh, I think we might look at some other directions as well. So, um, um, when we talk about uh, hate speech, uh, the Council of Europe defines it as any form of communication or expression which spreads, promotes, incites uh, racial hate, xenophobia, and sexism, or any other uh, any other uh, uh, hatred uh, communication based on tolerance. And in order to address this, because there uh, there have been uh, Increasing numbers uh, in um, statistics have been warned about this problem. The Council of Europe launched uh, launched a communication that uh, that was running from 2012 to 2014, which was aimed at uh, at addressing this problem. Now, what is specific about this uh, this campaign is that it is uh, run for the young people and by the young people, so kind of rely on them being engaged and then being active in uh, addressing the issue. Uh, on hate speech. So the, uh, this campaign is run uh, on national <coughs> levels, there are also some in, uh, international uh, uh, events as well. Uh, one of the important bits is the hate, uh, hate speech watch, which encourages all the uh, online citizens to uh, look for uh, or if they encounter report uh, report instances of online hate speech, which can then be analyzed and further dealt with by uh, high authorities as they are relevant. There are also blogs, uh, one, one which I will be um, addressing in particular. There are forums, uh, various surveys that I've done within this campaign, petitions, started to eliminate some of the um, hateful sites and similar. Um, the framework that I've chosen is positive discourse analysis, and it seems like a really, uh, really obvious good choice for, for this kind of discourse. Um, so uh, it did gain a popularity in, in 2000s, but now it's kind of dwindling down, so I hope. It will become more popular again. Uh, so it's not uh, you've been hearing about critical discourse analysis. I, I suppose for the two days, so I'm not going to go into that. But what I think, how I see positive discourse analysis is as an element within the critical discourse analysis. And I think when Van Dijk was kind of starting this movement, this is what he had in mind to to make a change, to create something, to make it, make things move and. and to bring about positive, um, positive processes. So I think that uh, although that was one of the initial uh, goals of critical discourse studies, I think that it's kind of gone straight. And if you go through um, discourse society and similar journals, if you, you skim through them and look at the titles, you will see only the negative things, which is good because it's important to be aware of that. But if we look at only those things, then we don't look at the discourses and the type of communication that actually got it right. So, um, when we're talking about positive discourse analysis, uh, Michael is one of the first people who introduced it, and uh, he basically um, uh, distinguished between uh, CDA reality, which focused on the deconstructive uh, part of the discourse, and the constructive one, CDA irrealis. Um, so um, people doing, uh, doing PDA have looked 
looked on different strategies for resistance on counter uh, counter discourses and those uh, contesting the, the mainstream ones. Uh, some of the previous studies have looked at reconciliation between um, between uh, various social groups. For example, uh, Martin looked at, at the situation in Australia. Uh, uh, Chris looked at uh, the reframing of uh, of the Russian coverage in the British press. We have uh, some more recent works on, in Wanaya, uh, Wanaya and uh, Wanaya, sorry, and uh, and some uh, some uh, thoughts about privatization of Colombian higher education. Had to take support. I'm sorry, I'm really struggling to to produce. Okay. So uh, one of the challenges um, in applying this um, this uh, framework, well, all of the challenges are very similar to to those of the CDA because it basically it is a part of CDA. So there is a inconsistency in terms of theoretical uh, paradigms that underline this approach. Uh, there, there is inconsistency in terms of methods applied, tools used. So. You, we could also argue that the researcher is biased, and that this might uh, might distort his, uh, his findings as well. Uh, the additional problem that the positive discourse analysis has is that it's seen by CDA people as an enemy, which is not the case. It's, supposed, it's meant to be complementary. It's meant to just give give the other side of the story as well. So um, the what I started from was I wanted to look which discursive strategies were used to oppose um, online hate speech uh, or, or uh, its offline instances as well. And I wanted to look um, at the political dimensions of some of the writings on the no hate speech, uh, in the no, no hate speech blog post. So um, I started looking, um, I went here mostly qualitatively, but at some point, I, I will get down to numbers as well. If you've got any suggestions for approach, please uh, uh, do, do approach me with that. So uh, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, at first look at all the articles, but then I noticed this um, uh, this bit called "Tell a Different Story," which I thought was more in, in line with with, with, uh, with my framework. So I wanted to focus on that and uh, tell a different story. Is a series series of posts which were written by. Uh, by refugees who were uh, who were at some point all victims of uh, of uh, both hate speech and online hate speech, and they produced um, uh, stories. Some of them were personal, some of them were more general, but there were their uh, uh, authentic, authentic stories um, published on the blog. So when analyzing this, I again went back to the CDA, and uh, I approached uh, I used the social semantic approach to discourse. So I uh, um, I applied uh, Van Leeuwen's um, legitimation strategies framework, and in particular, uh, I focus on the mythopoeses, such as since this one, uh, since all of these stories were, were based on narratives and were actually narratives of uh, of the authors. So um, within this, uh, this this scheme, I found the most frequent ones were moral tales and uh, cautionary tales as well. Uh, I expected to find more inversion and civilization, but that wasn't really, uh, really the case. So in moral tales, we've got uh, this kind of prototypical story about our hero who is uh, who's, um, in a very dire conditions, and uh, but he persists. He's very resilient, and at, and, and at the end, his uh, his persistence is rewarded, and he finally uh, receives reward in terms of uh, being integrated into society or accepted or something like that. So here we see um, we see one one of, um, one of such stories. Um, also, we see um, these moral stories. They all carry very strong motivational uh, motivational uh, feedback and, and, and input for uh, for the audience that uh, the blog targeted. There are also cash, uh, cautionary stories about people who uh, or other actors or groups who contributed to the uh, to the bad condition that the authors found themselves in. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of art, a lot a lot of articles started with cautionary tales and then ended up turning into uh, moral tales in the end. So I also looked at looked at uh, Martin's uh, kind of trajectory uh, of, of uh, reconciliation uh, realms, and I found instances of emotion. So this is where uh, where the authors kind of projected how they felt or how 
uh, what kind of uh, what kind of emotions they uh, they were exposed to uh, throughout their uh, their pathways, and uh, they also looked at uh, some of the ethical um, ethical considerations and tried to appeal to to the ethical uh, sense of uh, of their audience. Uh, in the in the third uh, realm, they they evaluate or appreciate either their own position or uh, or the or they are being appreciated by the, the members of the majority. And finally, there is this last step, which, which has not been achieved by all, all of the authors as the initiation. So they uh, they kind of all aim towards being being in, in um, some sort of harmony with uh, within the society within the, uh, within the majority group as well. I also looked at the elements of minimal politics. So these are uh, the criteria that. Uh, we could use to evaluate one uh, action as being political or poli politically engaged. So if an action has uh, an aim of becoming a majority, which was uh, the case here because uh, some, uh, the main kind of rationale be behind starting the, the blog is spreading uh, the idea of, of tolerance and uh, elimination of online hate speech. So it is something that should become a rule, not one exception. There's also strategies, so we will be doing that. We have national campaigns, we have uh, organized trainings, we've got online toolkits, so this is also very organized. There is a collectivity in creating, in uh, making a sense. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see the background, but the idea is you are part of this large group of people who are very tolerant, who are, um, who are accepting and, and, and friendly. Uh, there is also this conflict because they have to, uh, with the, within the work that they're doing, they have to attack or or come into some kind of uh, conflict with the people who do publish uh, such harmful and hateful uh, contents. There is also pos positionality, so they do uh, kind of determine their position with, uh, in, in reference to the political institutions, uh, even national uh, bodies, etc. So. So I wouldn't really call this a conclusion, but just um, some of the some of the remarks, some of the notes, notes that I can make at this point uh, of my research. So uh, I see that um, by using uh, myth versus as a discursive legitimation tool, what we do get is uh, we get voices for the min uh, minority that was normally the silence. If you look at the overall uh, public discourse. And we can notice a very consistent uh, trajectory of reconciliation as proposed by uh, Bonnie Martin and um, the elements of, of, of politicism in the actions that they uh, that they implement for this discourse. So we could call them uh, minimal political as well. Uh, however, the issue is uh, if these actions, if this writing is politically engaged, okay, but does it actually uh, achieve a political effect? So this is something that uh, which could be considered on a personal level. It sure does because of the an individual is involved in some kind of trainings or projects or something, it is, but uh, it's still um, the effects on global level are still um, have to be evaluated. And finally, I could ask it do we need PDA? Because we've got all, all this myriad of, of similar analysis uh, and approaches. I do feel that we need that. I do feel that at the point we do have to. Um, Send me back and not, not to sit down and relax and say, okay, the world is great, you know, we all emancipated, empowered, and everything. But we do have to look at people who did get it right and who are making a positive change. So. something if no one had anything related to it. This um, great speech and uh, I saw on the internet that, that you were doing this uh, research on um, this Croatian group uh, and from Croatia, this group, group of um, women of Italy. Ah, yes, that's in the name of family. I, I, and I, 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 could, you, could you, if no one has questions uh, regarding this, but I think that you, this, that, that part is actually, yeah. I mean, has something to do with this. 
So could you explain them well, what was going on and what were you doing? Yeah, um, that, is very, that is still in, in a very early stage, but what I am doing uh, with the referendum is I'm, I'm looking at the process that led to uh, institu institutionalization of a heteronormative um, model of marriage in Croatia. And this happened through uh, the initiative started by this group called In the Name of the Family, who started uh, petitioning and advocating uh, the change of the constitution. Although this it was regulated, yeah, yeah, it was they were formed in February 2013, but this was actually regulated already by the family law. So what they did was a huge waste of money. Um, if you're kind of you know, going to go into ideological things. So what they did is they started this really massive campaign, an expensive campaign, because there were there were many resources employed, and they managed to gather. Uh, I, I forgot the exact number of that, uh, signatures, but they did I guess uh, um, 700,000 yeah, or something like that. Yeah. It's a shocking number. So they uh, they got the petition, they sent it into uh, into the parliament, and it actually went through. And we had the uh, we had the uh, referendum on December first, two thousand thirteen, and then we changed the constitution. However, uh, after similar things uh, was similar thing was attempted by the headquarters for the defense of racial Booker, then we changed the constitution. So I think now uh, issues like that, so those that are targeted against minorities and that would result in reducing their human rights and civil rights, uh, they are not to be um, addressed in such political. I don't know if I've really got it, but I'm looking at how it happened, how, how, how everything, uh, because we, we don't normally, I mean, only when we have floods or united, we don't normally get together about things. And that's yeah. just, In Croatia, we don't, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about this, this thing that we need. Great.